All right, welcome back to First Available, the podcast where we talk all things disc golf. I'm your host, Christopher Smith, and we are on episode number six. Time is flying as this one will be posted on March 11th, 2024. We're just about an hour out from March 11th right now. I do these on Sunday evening. Usually that way I can see whatever happened in the Pro Tour or, you know, get through the weekend and try to give you guys um, some news first thing in the morning, Monday, hence the term first available, kind of the double entendre there. Obviously, we know what the other part of the first available is. It's the tree I usually hit whenever I'm playing disc golf. But um, this episode uh, today, plan on it being a little bit shorter than all the other ones. But then again, every time I say that to myself, I get to yapping about disc golf and I never shut up. So I uh, really do plan on this one maybe being a little bit closer to the 30 minute mark because I know some of the ones have been going over an hour. I don't really have like a target goal for these when I do them, but I do try to keep them in that like 30 to 60 minute. But we'll see what happens. Um, Let's touch on some news real quick about my own stuff before we get into the Pro Tour. So uh, some quick updates on the channel. Um, Again, I've been talking about it forever. It's finally coming to fruition. The Putter Madness 2024, Ross Landon and I actually recorded the first region last weekend. Um, You probably saw there's a teaser on my channel right now, just a little short clip of part of that. I did finish editing it. It is ready to upload, but I won't be doing that until two or three days. I'll do that in the middle of this week. I'll get it uploaded and and we'll put out the schedule of when everything should be done. Because what I'm trying to do is get them all done to where I can release uh, like one on Wednesday, one on Friday, and then, you know, the third and fourth one the following Wednesday and Friday. So there's not a big gap in between uploading each region. Uh, But yeah, I finished editing the first one. I shared it with Ross and Landon and my family. One of my favorite videos to date. Uh, I I really like the editing that was done on it, which, you know, toot my own horn since I'm the editor. But uh, it's got some cool graphics. Uh, It went pretty much as expected. I will say that if you watch the rules and explanation video, there's a slight tweak to it. We decided kind of on the spot that when we got to the final two discs of the region, that instead of just being, you know, a um, single elimination, that we would make it a best two of three. It made it a little bit more unique and actually made something pretty cool happen. But you'll see that here in a few days. Um, Other than that, everything else kind of worked as planned. I will say um, the one rule change that probably will be like heavy scratching your head was that originally on the explanation video, I said, you know, everything has to be putted out essentially. And if you tie, if both this birdie or both par, whatever it is, then it's CTP. We basically made it to where if one disc was in circle one and its opponent was not in circle one, Circle one kind of plays as an island green unless both are not in. So you're only going to see a couple putt offs between this. But other than that, I think everything went pretty good. So moving on from that, the other thing that came out and it is live right now is the giveaway I'm doing. So it was another thing I teased. Um, I had a custom disc. I put in an order for two of my own. It's actually the first available logo that is on these discs for the Axiom Hex. I ordered two of them, one for myself that I'll keep here in in the office, and then a second one that I'm doing a giveaway on. So if you missed that, head on over to the YouTube channel. There's a video on there, the 100 subscriber giveaway. It'll have all the details you need to get entered, but basically all you gotta do is go to that video and down in the details or the description of it, there'll be a link to a Google form. Fill in your name, email address, and hit submit. You're in, super simple. Again. I know I was saying in that video that a lot of times when people do these giveaways, they want you to like click on the video. They want you to be subscribed. They want you to make a comment and it's it's to help drive traffic to the channel. And that isn't the purpose of this giveaway. This one in specific was literally just a thank you for everyone that's already been involved. So I don't want you jumping through hoops for this. So that's it. Let's see. Other than that, um, on the channel, not really much else to talk about right now. I don't have any tournaments planned for the rest of uh, March. I am still looking for one in April, and I know that time is coming up quick, so really trying to find something to get on in April. I would like to get a biop if Ross and I could figure something out, but I was looking the other day, and it's kind of slim pickings in the area right now. So nothing going on in that regards. Uh, I will say that I do have a personal event coming up in two weeks. I have a I have to fly down to Florida for a few days in the middle of the week uh, for a wedding for my friends, so... If things get slow around that time, that, that'll that be the cause behind that. But that's pretty much it. All right, so without further ado, let's talk some pro pro stuff because I, I feel like there's enough content that happened over this weekend at the Waco 
um, what is it, the Waco Annual Charity Open, I believe is what it's labeled. Yes, Waco Annual Charity Open. Uh, we're going to talk some scores real quick, and then we'll hop in and talk a couple couple of the hot topics from this past week, because, of course, it's a disc golf, and apparently we can't go one week without having some hot button item. I don't know what else to call it. But let me throw it up on the screen here real quick, and we'll just talk scores for anyone that's watching along. So, oh, you know what? Real quick, before we actually get into the scores, I pride myself on trying to bring you guys breaking news nice and early Monday morning, as quick as my little editing fingers can do. So breaking news, in case you didn't hear it, you can tell everyone you heard it here first on First Available by Disc Smith Disc Golf, whatever my names are. Kristen Tatar is good at disc golf. So quote me on that because I feel like when she was not in the States and not competing, that it was almost like when mom's not home, right? Like all the kids were running around the house, having a grand old time. Well, everyone, mom is home and she is absolutely putting the smack down on everyone. She didn't miss a beat out there. Crazy. But yeah, um, let's go over the scores real quick or the, the, the placings of the Waco FPO field. So you got Kristen Tatar in first place, um, event rating 998. She shot a 60, 63, 59, and 62. So very consistent there. Uh, followed up by Own Scoggins uh, with a 980 event rating. I'm not going to go over, over every round score unless there's a reason to. Uh, then Holland Hanley in third place. So I was kind of excited to see that. If you've been listening along, you know Holland's kind of my pick for a breakout year this year. Evelina Solonen and Haley King round out the uh, top five. They were both tied for fourth place. You know, um, Ella Hansen, here's one thing to talk about real quick. Ella Hansen came out guns blazing. Round one, 59. Round two, 58. And then round three and the final round today, she just could not score. 70 and a 69. It's not even like she was making a bunch of mistakes. She just couldn't score on either day. So it was kind of a shame. If you remember last year, it came down to Ella and Kristen Tatar on literally hole 18. Ella threw over the right side of that lake uh, to get across, and she just went too far and went OB, ended up losing a stroke to Kristen and losing the tournament by one stroke there on at the end. So some other some other things going on. Uh, Paige Pierce, obviously, and Christine or Christina, uh, Katrina Allen. Um, they were struggling the first two days. Let's see, Paige Pierce shot a 68 and a 73 for the first two rounds. And then her third round was pretty good. She shot a, shot a 61 to get herself back over the cut line and into the final round, but she shot a 68 today. So um, not super impressive, but you know, not terrible either. People are giving Paige a lot of grief right now because, you know, she's been she was so good and so, you know, basically dominant for so many years. And now that she's having the slightest amount of trouble, people kind of write her off. I remember after the first and second round, people just like blasting her score out there about like they should be shocked by it. Like, can we take a second and remember that Paige Pierce had a season ending injury last year? Like she didn't sprain an ankle. She had to have surgery. She was out. Like not only the physical aspects of that are difficult to overcome. That's emotionally and mentally stressful as well. You don't just step back out on the course and start dominating. It's going to take her some time to get into the groove of things. But just because she's not winning tournaments right out uh, right out of the gate, coming back, does not mean that she is still not a good player. So I would not take your eye off of her. Now again, I I don't I don't see anyone beating Kristen. I mean, of course, there's going to be a tournament here and there that she's not going to win. Maybe <laughs> I can't even guarantee you that. But um, for the most part. I just I just can't see anyone beating Kristen on any consistent type basis. I like I'd be shocked if Kristen lost back-to-back tournaments this year. All right. Um I don't think there's much else to talk about FPO wise. Everything else was pretty smooth over the weekend. No drama that I can really think of. Ella Hansen, Missy Gannon, Lucky in the top 10. That was pretty cool to see. Oh, I am completely incorrect. There is a hot button item to talk about FPO wise, but we will do that after we recap MPO scores. So 
I'm going to throw it up here on the screen for the MPO side of things. This was a really fun watch this weekend. Mr. Gannon Burr took away the win on the last hole. So he shot a 1044 rated uh, event, uh, 37 under par, which is insane. Something has to be done about these scores. Like, I don't know. I don't know if the pars just need to change or what it is, but 37 under pars, even though it's four rounds, what is that? Nine under par? Eh, maybe that's not too terrible. That would kind of be the limit for me. Four round, the, To me, if you're able to easily... I say easily with air quotes for if you're not watching. If you're able to easily shoot half of the course under, you know, birdie, um, that the the par, the course layout, whatever the design, it might be a little bit too padded, might be a little bit too easy for you. Now, granted, you know, you got three guys that shot that high. Everyone else is like five, six strokes behind them, and we'll pop it back up on the screen and go over everyone's scores here in a moment. But uh, Gannon Burr. If you didn't watch it today, you you really missed a treat. So Luke Humphreys shot amazing all weekend. He shot, let's, let's throw the scores up here. All right, so Luke Humphreys shot a 55, a 54, a 54, and a 55. If that is not the definition of consistent, I don't know what it is. Because Gannon Burr shot a 54, so he had one stroke, one stroke on Humphreys after round one. Then a 57... So he lost three there, so he's down two strokes. And then he shoots a 52, gains two strokes on Humphreys, and then shoots a 54 compared to Humphreys 55 today to win by one stroke on the literal last shot of the day. Last shot of the tournament. So this was really exciting to watch. Um, you know, I've only been in disc golf for a couple years, but when I saw Luke out there, like I've seen some of his stuff, like when he hosts the skins, like Luke Humphreys, in my opinion, is a very likable guy. Like I like watching him entertain. And especially at the end of round three, when he realized he was going to be on the car with Gannon Burr, and he kind of called Gannon out, but it seemed like it was more of a friendly manner. Like he said something along the lines of like, oh, who am I playing with, Gannon? I'll see you tomorrow, boy. Like, you know, because Luke Humphreys, is, he's a little bit closer to my age. I think he's like 35. Um, I don't know. I was really... Uh, I found today to be really difficult because if you watch the podcast where um, Ross and Landon were on, I think it was like episode three, maybe four. So what was it? it? Had to be four. So when we did the draft, we kind of talked about our picks for this year, and I my two picks for this year of having good seasons. I mean, not some. I'm not some wonder wonder child here picking these. It's not like it's some hot take. I picked Gannon Burr and um, Isaac Robinson. I thought that those are going to be the one two combo. Uh, for MPO field this year. And Gannon Burr is not disappointing that already. He's playing real good. Now, Isaac had a had a rough weekend. I don't want to segue off to that, but you, he had a couple of shots that just in the early rounds hurt him. But uh, Gannon Burr played extremely well. He had one putt today on like, I don't remember the exact hole. I think it's like hole 11, something between like 11 and 13. We all know Gannon putts hard, but... um. He put hit center chains and should have been in the basket, and it just spit it right back out. And that wasn't even like that hard of a putt. And I don't know; it might it might be these prodigy baskets. But watching Gannon today was fun. Nicholas Antala, Nicholas Antala, he was playing really good. Look at this: fifty-one on round one. I need to hotkey this: fifty-one on round one, then a fifty-nine, which. That was the round where he, him and his the rest of his card, James Conrad, Barsby, who else was on their card? I think Klein. I think Kyle Klein, um, if I'm not mistaken. They they had the rain delay, right? Yeah, that was the rain delay on Friday that happened. They had to come back out Saturday morning and finish that round in like terrible conditions. So, Nicholas Santola struggled there with the 59. And then round 355, and then today he was shooting lights out again. So you had Gannon Burr, Nicolas Antala, uh, Luke Humphreys. There were a couple other players like your Anthony Barella, Mason Ford. They were kind of in it there until like the last third of the course today. By that time, it was kind of like, okay, you know, they're not they're not going for that first place, but they'll be fighting for podium spots. But I found it really difficult to who to root for because I like Gannon Burr. Obviously, I picked him as one of my favorites for this year. Nicolas Santala 
is an amazing player. Another young talent that I would like to see him have, you know, a, a good breakout win. And then there was Luke Humphreys, like I was saying, you know, one of the older, you know, one of the old guard coming out. And he was shooting lights out. He was shooting so good. So when he was in the running there at the end, I, you know, today I was like, I really hope, you know, Luke holds on to this. And I remember watching them play hole 17, which if you didn't watch it, it's a, it's a pretty daunting um, hole. And he was up. Pretty sure Humphrey was up by one on Burr and two by Antela, something like that. Something like that. But the entire card, Mason Ford, Luke Humphreys, Gannon Burr, who was the furthest one out off the drive. And who else was on their card? I don't know. I can't can't remember off the top of my head, but um damn, who was that? Gannon Burr, it wasn't Antela, Humphreys, it wasn't Brilla, Mason Ford. Well, for whatever reason, it's it's escaping me. But anyways, they um this this hole you got water on the right, right, and the green is on a major slope, uh, so it, it's it's a tough it's a tough hole that sees a lot of people make mistakes on and take bogey. Gannon Burr put it a little bit deep on the backside, so he had like a circle two, I think, putt to come back and absolutely nailed it, which would put the jitters in me if that happened to me, but. Then after Mason Ford and God, I can't remember who else was on that card. Anyways, I don't want to sit here all day trying to figure out. It wasn't Kyle Klein. Oh, it was uh, Sexton, Nate Sexton. They all hit birdie. And then even though Luke Humphreys was the closest one, he still had like maybe a, a 15, 20 footer, just a little nerdy putt, but it's a dangerous type putt. And he made it. So at that point, I'm thinking like, oh, he's got this in the bag. You know, he's... He's one up on the hell was he? He was one up on Burr. Yeah. Yep. He was one up on Burr and Antela. If I'm not mistaken, Luke Humphreys was at 37 under par. Burr and Antela were tied at 36 under par. Going in hole 18. But Luke Humphreys has T-pad. So he drives... And I wasn't familiar with hole 18's layout. I don't remember it from round three, or I'm sorry, from round two. But the moment you let go of it, I was like, oh, man, that looked like he kind of yanked that. And sure enough, I think he did. I don't think he hit the line he was going for. I think I think the nerves got to him a little bit. He yanked it, got lucky, got cleared out, no problem. And then he went to take his second shot because he was out, and he left it short on a golf green. He made basically the one mistake you couldn't make. And when he left it short, Maybe a foot, too. So that was tough. And then Gannon Burr just crushed it and went over the top. And he gave himself maybe a 15, 20 footer for looking at birdie. So at that point, when Luke Humphreys had to take his approach shot, so he's dropping three, shooting four uh, for par. That's correct. Yeah, shooting four for par. Um, He tried to throw it in, made a good run, didn't, didn't catch any metal, but it was the right height right speed it was just a foot left of the basket and he missed it and it just it left the door open he fell back to 36 under after cleaning up the bogey to tie Antela and Gannon Burr crushed that putt there was no missing it now I know that Terry and Nate Doss probably couldn't see but I I saw on the camera when uh, Gannon Burr's shot came in I don't know what cameras they were watching but that disc stopped like 15 20 feet and there's no way Gannon Burr is missing that putt no way so he smashed it, um, won won the tournament. But man, here we are, March tenth. Already some super exciting disc golf. So it was really fun to watch. All right. So last order of business here on the scores. Let's just run down a few more of the notable names here. Again, we had Burr in first place, and then Antela and Humphreys tied for second. Anthony Barilla coming in fourth. So AB keeps finding himself in that top five ish. I think he finished in top five last week as well. Uh, uh, Barella and Mason Ford tied at fourth. Dickerson at sixth. Ezra Robinson, Barsby, and Kyle Klein tied at seventh. And then to round out your top ten, uh, Wysocki, Adam Hammes, who is quiet all weekend somehow. I didn't even hear his name brought up, but he's tied for tenth. Casey White. Casey White is playing really good. It seems like he's getting better every year. Joel Freeman, Nate Sexton, all tied for tenth. So, 
that rounds out your top 10. Some good stuff to see there. All right. Now, I don't want to be the one to have to do this, but apparently I have to be. A couple hot topic items from the weekend. First off, social media. Again, here's breaking news for you. is an absolute dumpster fire. And I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's because this year I'm personally paying more attention to these kind of things due to the fact that I do the podcast and the YouTube and stuff now. But in years past, yeah, someone would say something on social media and you'd be like, oh, that's a dumb take. But it just seems like it's all day, every day during these tournaments. Whether people are bringing up the Natalie Ryan stuff or whether people are bringing up the time clock stuff or people are bringing up the putt stuff. People just seem to have the worst, the worst damn takes on these things. And the one that was really bothering me this weekend was Ricky Wysocki got a two-stroke penalty for breaking a rule. He got on his Instagram, and look, I, I like Ricky Wysocki. If you don't like Ricky Wysocki, it's probably a you problem. The dude is super nice, extremely talented at disc golf. But me being older and understanding some things, God, I sound like my damn parents. Me being older and understanding some things, there is accepting responsibility for your actions, accepting the consequences, and then there is claiming that you are while not actually doing it. And I'm sorry, Ricky, but that is what happened with that post on your Instagram. So if you missed it, the new rule this year is that you have to be checked in at your tee to start your round at least five minutes in advance. When it is five minutes before your designated tee time, if you are not there and checked in, you are late, you have broken the rule, you are assessed a two-stroke penalty. This is a very binary, very black and white deal. There is no, oh, I was late to the check-in, but I was early to my tee time. That does not exist. That is fake. I watch all these people on Facebook make these comments like, oh, it's so stupid. He was 30 seconds late but he was four minutes and 30 seconds early. No, no, he wasn't. He was only 30 seconds late. doesn't matter. The only thing that is important about your tea time is that tells you the time that you need to be there five minutes before. If you're not there five minutes before your tea time, guess what? You were late and it is on you. I'm an amateur player, right? I've played in two solo tournaments and I played in like four biops. Any and every time, I have a tea time. If my tea time's at noon, guess when I'm getting there? I'm aiming to get there 45 minutes early. Yeah, I'm going to have to stand around. I'm going to be maybe bored. Guess what? I can stretch. I can warm up. I always make sure that I am within eye shot of where I need to be 45 minutes early. And that's so that I don't run into any, any issues. Like even one of the announcers came on. This is not during the live coverage. This is during, during the tournament central. And I don't remember his name. And look, I'm not trying to put him on blast. Like, how dare he say that? Because, you know, I do this right here. And sometimes I watch back. I'm like, oh, I don't, didn't even realize I kind of said it like that. And I think that's the case. But he had mentioned, like, you know, you should try to leave early. Because, you know, sometimes sometimes stuff just happens. Like, sometimes there's traffic. Like, no. Dude, you are a professional disc golfer. There is absolutely, unless, like, unless everyone is late. Because, like, a major highway is shut down from a horrible accident. Like, you can't show up five minutes late and like, oh, you know, traffic on the highway was a little bit slower. Dude, you should be aiming to get there 45 minutes to an hour before your tea time. It's it's that simple. But yeah, anyways, I watched Ricky's post. He was apparently 30 seconds late to checking in. I guess one of the card mates flagged down a, a tournament director. They assessed the penalty. Some people are calling that person a snitch. Whatever, Ricky got on his Instagram and to his credit... He gave the insight because the worst thing about this from my perspective is trying to figure out exactly what happened. If you remember two weekends ago, I think it was with the the Haley King thing and someone peeing on the course, like I'm trying to figure out who did this. And it's like, it's hard to find out sometimes. So I do like that Ricky went out there and, and he gave his perspective. And he even said at first that, you know, like, hey, I was late. It was my fault. But then he immediately turned around and said that the rule is stupid, which is a fair point. If you don't like that rule, I'm not even as fired up as I am about this, if they were to say, Hey, you know, next year that rule was stupid. Just be there by your tea time. I wouldn't care. I wouldn't be upset at all. But again, it just boils down to, there is a time you were required to be there. And if you're not there, what's everyone else supposed to do? 
I just don't like when people are saying that someone was late, but they were early. No, no, they weren't. And I can give you the opposite side perspective on that. I remember when I was like 20, 21, I was interviewing for a job. And the person interviewed me, asked me a question. Hypothetically, if you're supposed to be at work at 8 o'clock in the morning, 8 a.m., at what time would you consider yourself late? And I knew what they wanted to hear. They wanted me to say, well, if I'm not there 5, 10, 15 minutes early, then I'm late. I didn't tell them that. I said, well, if I look at the clock and it says 8.01, I'm late. If I look at the clock and it says 8 and I'm there, I'm not late. I will say one thing that shocked me because I started replying on one of the Facebook posts about this. Like, should they go down to the second? Because if you don't know, this is actually what I do for a living. I'm a, uh, I'm a programmer and data analyst for time and labor management. I write code that looks at employees' data, looks at what time they punch in, what time they punch out, totalizes it, sends that data to payroll so that they can get paid. That's what I do for a living. So I know like the fact that they're willing to go down to the second is kind of concerning to me. Um, and here's the reason why. Um, if you're not familiar with, with clocks, like they are affected. Like if you don't work in this field, it, God, I, I don't, I shouldn't even go into this damn topic. It's, it's too, it's too technical, but here's the problem. If you try to track time down to the second, like it gets super granular. You, one person's clock could say, you know, 13 seconds after the hour. And then your clock could say 14 seconds after the hour. That one second is a very granular mark to miss. And I don't like that. Um, I will say that I was super shocked when I saw a picture of the clocks that they use. It's an atomic clock, so it is accurate. Now, most people don't have atomic clocks. So like your normal, it doesn't matter if it, right now, if you set your watch that is, you know, a super accurate watch to the exact time to an atomic clock over time, it can come out of sync, even if it's by one second. But that's why it kind of shocks me. I think that maybe the rule should be like, hey, you need to be there five minutes before your tea time. But when are you considered not there five minutes before? I don't think that four minutes and 30 seconds, this is going to sound like I'm contradicting everything that I just said. And, and, and to the degree, if you felt that way, I, I wouldn't blame you, but I don't like tracking time to the second because it gets really hard to get that precise accurately between everyone. Cause what happens if Ricky Wysocki's watch had said, you know, I'm actually 20 seconds early. I'm five minutes and 20 seconds before my tea time, but your clock says I'm four minutes and 30 seconds. Obviously if you have an atomic clock, that's pretty accurate, but if you're not, they should be, they should be tracking everything down to the minute. Anyways, I'll talk all day about this because like I said, I do this for a living and it's annoying to watch people say that someone's early and late. No, they're not. I don't care what the rule is, but the rule is the rule. I will say two strokes, two strokes seems kind of dang severe. I don't think you can give a warning because being told up front what time you got to be there is kind of your warning. Maybe one stroke, maybe one stroke. I don't, I don't, I don't know. It's not that I want Ricky or any other player to be penalized for this, but the rules are the rules. And that's the other problem is that obviously on last week's podcast, we talked about um, Jacob Curtis, right? Yeah, so last week we talked about Jacob Curtis's um, extremely long putt times. And then, of course, every single person on Facebook wants to bring up, well, it's not fair, Ricky Rysaki's 30 seconds late, even though he's four minutes and 30 seconds early and you penalize him, but you don't penalize you know, Jacob Curtis for taking a long time to putt. That's not relevant. That, that, those are two separate rules. That's like saying, oh my gosh, like you don't penalize Jacob Curtis for taking a long time to putt, but you punished me for going a half an inch out of bounds. It's dumb. Those two rules have nothing to do with each other. No, Jacob Curtis should not be taking a minute to putt. His card mates should be calling him out on that. Hopefully he's getting that point. And again, I don't want to see these players get penalized, but just because one person quote unquote breaks a rule and gets away with it doesn't mean that we just start letting everyone break rules because the example I just gave you, okay, well, you don't punish Ricky Wysocki for breaking the being on time rule. Well, now what if it's me? What if I'm a half an inch out of bounds? And I know people will scoff at that, but Look, these are separate topics. All the rules should be enforced to the maximum that they can be. And again, all the rules should be written to a place where it keep it keeps the 
the game fair and even for all competitors while being the least intrusive. Let's move on to the other hot topic of the weekend or, or a other another hot topic for the weekend. So here's another one that bothered me. Um, Maria Oliva. She apparently only lives like an hour or two hours away, something like that, in Dallas, if I'm not mistaken. Somehow, and this blows my mind almost as much as, no, not almost, this blows my mind way more than being 30 seconds late as a professional disc golfer. She forgot her bag. And there is almost no excuse for that ever. You're a professional disc golfer. You could forget... Hell, you could probably forget your disc golfing shoes, right? I could I could maybe see a rare scenario where, hey, I just had a, a brain fart type day and I forgot my shoes. I forgot whatever. The one thing that you cannot forget is your bag that has the damn things you're going to be throwing. So she apparently forgot her bag. Um, I don't know the details around how she got a bag put together, but somehow she got a bag that was not hers put together for her to go out there and play round one. Shot an 87, which was like, what is a 27 over? Something like that. Let's check this. Let's pull up the scorecard and look at it. Because even if you forget your bag, I still don't know how you do this as a professional disc golfer. So Maria Oliva, 21 over on day one. She forgets her bag, goes out there and birdies hole one. So that's good. Birdie, par, par, and then a snowman. Now, I don't know the details of this. I mean, it's a it's a 441-foot hole, hole four. So I'm, I'm imagining she went out of bounds. Let's take a look here. Okay. Yeah, I missed the drive. Oh, my gosh. Okay. That makes a little bit more sense. Four circle one putts. I don't know. I, I didn't see the footage. I would like to see how she missed that putt because maybe maybe there might be a scenario where, you know, this isn't my, my actual putter. If he missed that, maybe just lay the second one up. A three is better than a four, but I, I can see going for it. Maybe it rolled away. Like, I'm not going to, you know breaker too bad on having a hole that's bad. But it seems like that's where the problem was here on hole eight as well. There was another four putt. But then see she birdied hole nine. Gosh, here's a nine. I mean it's a five hundred and thirty foot hole. I don't know. Obviously it wasn't her bag. Um I don't know what discs were given to her, but I feel like if somebody you know, especially when you're on a pro tour, I'm sure there's plenty of good discs out there for you to throw. If somebody threw together a bag for me, I would like to think that I wouldn't go 21 over par. But I don't even fault her for that. Like, if anything, I'll give her credit for going out there and still playing, even though she didn't have her bag. What I will not give her credit for is not playing. Because, Again, she she lives within an hour or two away. Why did she not go get her bag or have someone bring her her bag? Like again, I, I feel bad because I don't know the exact details around this. Maybe there is a legitimate reason why that wasn't feasible. But I would think so. If I was playing Idlewild, which is two hours away from here, and I forgot my bag, guess what I'm doing the moment I finish my round? I would have either made accommodations for someone to swing by my house and get my bag and and pay them to meet me or bring it down to me, whatever it is, or I would drive up here grab it and go back like two hours kind of is that mark where she should have been able to do that. But then you have the other side of things where she could take a DNF and maybe not hurt her rating. And that's the only reason I could see, you know, dropping out of a tournament. So another example, um, I got into disc golf in 2021. And of course, as I start learning who these players are and hearing stuff about, things that had happened to them prior to me watching disc golf. I try not to let that affect me. I don't want to dislike any disc golfer because of something that I didn't even get to witness. So a great example is Nico, Nico Locastro. I had heard about him losing his temper and, you know, this, that, and the other. And I try not to let that affect me. And then I saw him at the Euro tour, tour, I think it was 2022, right? Where the, 
official called him for a time delay and he blew up and acted like a child. Even that, which was completely unacceptable, you know, at least it didn't get physical. Um, but I still try not to hold that against someone because, you know, every, everyone has bad days. It was a really bad day, but like, I don't have anything against Nico. Um, when I do get to watch him on, on any coverage, like, he, you know, no issue with it. Um, I've tried really hard not to dislike any disc golfer because I enjoy the sport. I will say that last year it kind of rubbed me wrong. Haley King dropping out of a tournament last year. I, I don't like quitting. And then I would come to find out that according to her, um, she had dropped out due to injury and I kind of, I took her to word for it, but in the back of my mind, cause I watched the coverage, she was playing really bad. And then I thought, well, you know, maybe she is playing bad because she's hurt. I don't know. And then like a week or two later, she came out and won a tournament and was all happy go lucky. And I was like, you know, whatever, just I'll move on. But then the same thing happened two weeks ago. That tournament where she made a huge stink about some caddy peeing somewhere. And apparently she blew up cussing out a tournament director. Again, I wasn't there. I didn't see it. But if, if the stories are true, that's as far as the knowledge goes that I'm aware of. But she dropped out of that tournament. And it looked a lot like last year where she said that she was injured. And she was playing really bad. And to me, it looked like she was dropping out because she was playing bad. And I don't know the motive, and I'm not going to try to speculate on the motive of why people would do that. But I don't like quitting. And it's really tough because I don't ever want a player that has an actual injury to feel compelled to play through it and injure themselves more. That's not a good idea. But you should probably have a good feel for whether or not you're injured, especially if this is a recurring theme, right? Like... I don't see how you drop out and then a week or two later, your guns blazing. And I, I really got tired of hearing it today on the final round. Um, the commentators would not shut up about Haley King's injury. Let me tell you something. Almost every single player out there in that field is injured. It's extremely rare that professional athletes play and they're not injured. That's, that's part of the game. You're putting a lot of stress and wear and tear on your body and it's extremely rare that there's going to be a player that's not fighting through some sort of pain. There's a difference between fighting through pain and having an injury. And I'm going to tell you from firsthand experience, I've been playing without an ACL in my left my left knee. I blew my ACL in 2022, and I was out playing disc golf like a dumbass three weeks later on crutches. Because, And I'm not saying that anyone should do that. They shouldn't do that. If you have a serious injury, you shouldn't be playing. But it just, I don't know. From my perspective, it seems like every time that She's not shooting well. She's injured. And and I don't know. I think the real problem here is the way the DNF works is that you don't get penalized for it. And it's tough because if somebody is legitimately, legitimately injured out there, again, I don't want to penalize a player for being unable to compete. But what I do wish that we could do, and there may not be a reasonable way to do this, I wish that we could penalize the heck out of players that DNF because they're not playing well or players that DNF because they forget their equipment, or players that DNF because they have an attitude. I don't like it. It's a bad look for the sport. It's just my my opinion. Like obviously, other people are gonna feel completely different about it, but it just really rubs me the wrong way. I don't like seeing that. And again, I hope that no play. I doubt any players are gonna hear this podcast, but in the event that they do, I don't think that any players should force themselves to to play if they are risking being seriously injured. But if you're a little sore, guess what? Everyone else is a little sore too. You know, the Maria thing too is really a shame. She's, she's been a player that I, I kind of liked out of the gate. Um, mostly she throws uh, thought space athletics. That's how I found out about her. Uh, even commented on one of her posts last year when she aced something with her Votum. I was like, Hey, like I like the Votum. Votum's a great disc, but I'll tell you what I really liked, especially last year was her special edition construct got like four of them because they are you got the the standard construct here which is already i mean we all know tsa's got the best stamps you got that standard construct but then i had these and i actually lost one that kind of hurt my feelings but these are awesome drivers especially like um 
if you don't have super high arm speed and stuff. Let's look at that. Six stamp. I love this disc. Now, uh, it's not in my bag anymore. This one's Domi, which is weird. Anyways, I don't need to segue off that, but like I had nothing against Maria Oliva. have nothing against um, Haley King as, as people. Um, I'm only judging this strictly from the quality of professional level disc golf. You are professionals. You have chosen this profession. You're fortunate and lucky, and you have worked hard enough to earn a spot being a professional disc golfer. Please conduct yourself as such when you're out there and don't quit unless you unless you do legitimately have an injury. By all means, do. Um, broken record over here. All right, so I think this will probably be the last topic that we talk about for today's episode. Like I said, this one will probably be a little bit shorter, but um, I want to look at we, what we have coming up. So obviously we just had the Waco event. Okay, I thought that we were going to have a two-week break, but it looks like the Austin Open is next weekend. Yeah, it's only in five days, so that's awesome. I thought I was, I wish that I could have disc golf every weekend, but I know that's just not feasible. So we got the Austin Open, and then we have a week break, and the following week after that, so it'll be two weeks after Austin, we got the Texas State Championships taking place in Houston, and then we have a two-week break going to Jonesboro, one week to the Music City Open. In two weeks to the DDO. So a lot of disc golf on the horizon as far as the DGPT schedule goes. I will say that I, I really enjoyed um, the Disc Golf uh, Pro Tour Plus, the Elite Series Plus event today, you know, the four rounds. Obviously, I'm, I'm a junkie. If I can get four or five rounds of disc golf, I love it. I'll, I'll take it all in. But this week is, or, or this year is already flying by Oh, you know what? There there was one other thing. Um, I don't know if it's a great thing to bring up here, but I'm going to. I saw something pop up when I was watching uh, the first round or two of coverage over the week, and it was um, pured disc golf. And I thought it was going to be another competitor app to um, UDisc or P PDGA Live, and it doesn't appear that it is. So I did download this the moment I saw it. I set up an account and stuff. Um, app looked kind of cool. I was expecting it to have a scorecard. It did not. As far as I can tell, this is more of a social um, scheduling app. So um, as far as I can tell, it looks like something that you can set up around. Like if, you know, I don't need this. And it's not a practical use for myself. Whenever I play Ross and I, well, we obviously we just message each other through Facebook Messenger or whatever and set up a time and day. I mean, we usually try to play the same time most days anyways. But if you're someone that's maybe running some casual events or something like that, I guess you can use this app and set it up and that way you can share or, or meet up with other people. So maybe there actually is a practical use for this. Maybe I should bring this up with a group, but I just signed up um, on the animated disc golf here in Dayton, Ohio. That's a, a group on Facebook. Um, I don't know if group's the right, the right word, but animated disc golf here in Dayton, Ohio, they run a bag tag league and I joined it in 2022, but I didn't get to participate because I blew, I blew my knee out. Uh, but I saw there were openings for it. They were trying to fill the last like 15 spots. So I signed up for that. Maybe this would be a good way to get people on there, you know, all in the same group and be able to set up, Hey, we're having a bag tag round Saturday and everyone come out and I don't know, maybe it would be good for that. But um, I will say that it, it did not have a lot of courses on it. So it's super early. Um, I don't feel fair judging it. I mean, obviously, they're still trying to get their stuff together. But we'll see how that comes along. All right, so that is going to wrap it up for us. Just, again, quick reminders um, coming in the, in the next week or two, the Putter Madness stuff. Keep a lookout on the YouTube channel. It's going to be awesome. There is a link on my Facebook. I actually built um, a bracket out on bracketfights.com to where you can get on there before we start publishing these videos and you can make your own like actual March Madness bracket for it. You can select the winners all the way down throughout the whole thing. Super cool if you're into that stuff. So if you like March Madness, you'd probably have a blast doing that, I think. Check it out. Um, go to the YouTube channel, uh, Dismith Disc Golf, and make sure to check out that 100 subscriber video. There's a form down at the bottom. You don't have to be subscribed. You don't have to comment. Don't have to like. You don't have to do anything other than click on that form 
enter your first name, last name, and email address, and you'll be entered in to win that disc. And other than that, that's going to wrap it up. So as always, I do appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you for stopping by, and we'll see you next week.